My guest today is Shander Dahl. Shander, how are you doing? Good. How are you, David? I'm doing really well. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm the CEO of Kasten, and we do a lot of enterprise projects, startups, and we help them go to cloud. I mean, you know, web development, big data, AI, and pretty much anything that's cutting edge with all sorts of good technology out there. Yeah, and you don't specialize in one particular cloud. You've done work in lots of different vendors' clouds, right? Absolutely, and you know most of it is um, Azure, AWS, GCP. But we've also done, you know, Pivotal and a lot of others that are cloud-related technologies, mm -hmm. and sometimes even Oracle, IBM. You know. Yeah, I, I, I let's let's talk about it. We're, we were going to talk about artificial intelligence. And because all the major cloud players have AI services, but they're not, they're similar, but they're not identical. Can you compare and contrast some of those? Well, absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting about um, AI services on cloud is still a very, very new field. And there's really no one winner. Yeah, and, and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, I can show you some of our PowerPoint that I have. Oh, sure. Go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, so this is... Um, you know, a detailed version of, can you see it? I see a picture of you, looking good. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, here's some information about me and, uh, you know, if anyone wants to connect, they can definitely connect on LinkedIn. And if they want any information about this particular presentation, you know, feel free to contact my team. Okay. And just a disclaimer, the results are basically May 20th of 2020, and that's about two years ago. And these mm -hmm. are public results. We have a public report about it too. And mm -hmm. then at that time, I think Amazon had a communication. They let us know that they did not support handwriting recognition. So just to make sure their viewers know this. Hmm. What do you think about this slide? The failure rate between 83 and 92%. That's not very good. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I wouldn't pass too many exams if my failure rate was uh, 92%. Yeah, and you know, when I read that article, uh, look at that partial quote that's over there. As an industry, we're worse than gambling. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and know, what does Gartner, that mean? When you say failure rate, what are we talking about? We're talking about somebody tries to, for example, identify a picture, and it's a picture of an elephant, and it says that it's a frog, or is it something more, uh, is it worse than that? You know, I bet what they probably are talking about is a lot of these projects that are scheduled to be done. Either they don't get done or they don't get the right results and things like that. Uh, or, you know, I mean, overall, I think it's a project failure rate rather than a specific task, I guess. Uh, so the AI might be performing perfectly, but the project itself never goes to fruition. Yeah, and, you know, by perfectly, you know, you don't necessarily think that any AI is perfect. I mean, I think right. it's probability, so they're pretty good, but uh, I don't think even humans are perfect, so yeah. you've got to be careful with that word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but look uh, at the second one, right? 85% of AI implementations will fail. That's a Gartner prediction mm -hmm. uh, by 2022. And here we are right now, and it's, uh, I don't think that's unfair I, that, that may have... I don't know what the number is, but uh, certainly I've seen a lot of projects fail for various reasons, uh, many of them not technical at all. That's true. You know, a lot of it is really not technical, and that's why I love this slide. <laughs> that's you. That's your boys. Thanks. I mean, you know, we've got 100% success on all AI projects, but, you know, as a company that specializes in tech, I mean, we don't even have the opportunity. You know, we just can't fail. The point is we'll do all the work ahead of time to go, is it – is it really something that's doable? You know, there's no point spending millions of dollars and then failing. I mean, there's a lot of work done up front to make sure that we have yeah. the right expectations because, you know, sometimes maybe you don't have the right expectations in AI, right? Like, take Elon Musk. A lot of times he said things about full self-driving or other things, and, you know, it's always been delayed. So there's, you know, it also depends on what kind of project. Like, I'm not saying that Caston's going to go tomorrow and deliver an FSD overnight, right? And there's got to be reasonable expectations. So that's where... Success rate, it's very, very important to understand beforehand what you are getting into. But something like, you know, more than 80% failure rate is just sad. It is. I've actually, I'll, I'll point this out. I've been on a couple of AI projects where we, the project manager started the conversation with the customer 
by letting them know that it's possible that if we're doing predictive analysis from a bunch of text documents, we may not be able to do any predictive. That data may not be in those text documents to accurately perform anything. That those expectations were set right at the very beginning. We can, we're going to do this work, and there's really no promise that we're going to get anything useful out of it. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's very good that, uh, you know, you lead with that approach. We always yeah, do that. because you don't know the data before you look at the data. That's very important. And, you know, that's another thing that a lot of times uh, customers um, want only a subset of the data to be given to companies that are coming to deliver projects. And um, that may not really represent everything that you really need to create the best AI service. And there's a lot of other reasons, right? Like another one is scalability. We've actually seen customers. Uh, the recent one was they spent, I think, a few million or so. And they were trying to run everything in R. Turns out it was a deterministic algorithm that R is extremely slow for. And yeah. I think then they later moved it to Python. And by the time we came in, they were given up. They said cloud doesn't work. They said cloud doesn't scale. And we're like, none of this is true. And what's interesting is that something like that would work really well in C Sharp or Java or, or C++ or C because they're actually a deterministic uh, algorithm, not necessarily an AI algorithm. I think ah. they completely, re re I mean, they did it in a different way. And then, of course, you know, we help them just do it the regular way. And a lot of times, you know, I mean, AI is not the solution for every single thing. There's a lot of yes. things you can do on your, with just simple deterministic programming. And, you know, scale also, interestingly, becomes an art as well as science because, I think all clouds can scale easily, but most customers that come to us are not necessarily 100% on a cloud or two. They would like to be on multi-cloud, right? They have different kinds of databases. They have a lot of on-premises. They have hybrid situations, right? They have some stuff on microservices. They've got a bunch of monoliths. I mean, they have different kinds of databases, polyglot persistence. I mean, they have different caching needs. They have different offline processing situations. And there's a lot that gets involved in finally making that work. And anything can scale, but what does that really mean, right? Customers come to us not because, hey, make a scale and I'm going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. They come to us and it's like, well, I want you to scale me at the same time, save me another 10 or 15 million, right? And that's where we can show them how to take advantage of multi-cloud situations and things like that and save a lot of money while making your applications way faster and better. And interestingly, you know, you could do that today. You couldn't do it 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the different clouds or the architecture. Let's go through your slides here. What, what do we've got? Um... Yeah, so, you know, the scale part, I think, is, is a very long discussion, and I think we should table that for today. But here is a very simple way to use AI for people that don't have AI experience, right? So we wanted to show this, that you could use all the three clouds, um, Amazon, Google, as well as Azure, and just by making a bunch of AI API calls, literally simple get post calls, you could use AI. So for example, if you look at the uh, image on the left-hand side, beautiful cursive handwriting, and on the right-hand side, you get the results by AI looking at it. And this is just one call to an API on any of the three clouds, how cool that is. Like you didn't have to do anything whatsoever, and you can just do it, right? And you know, here's some benchmarks that um, Probably not going to get into the detail, but here are the three things that I wanted to show you. We picked a really um, interesting picture on the left-hand side. As you can see, it's, it's so hard that even humans will have a hard time reading it. Right. And there are some words here that you can see, like, follow these seven rules. It says S-E-7-E-N. It doesn't even say S-E-V-E-N, but the moment a human reads it, somehow humans go, oh, that's seven, right? And AI right. would go S-E-7-E-N, which is actually right. And then the second one, as you see, is the same picture, beautiful handwriting, right, cursive, so it's probably easier to train. And then the right-hand side is French, but also we want to trick the AI. So what we did is we got two pictures together, and we, we said, okay, what, what happens now? Does AI go that these are two different images or things are one image, and how does it understand the line, right? So it's also a little curved. And these are pictures we just Googled, by the way, so we got pictures from Google, random data. And look at the results here. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, I mean, there's a lot of reds, as in Google's getting a lot of reds. Those are kind of the ones that didn't get it right. You know, Microsoft has less reds in that situation, you'll notice. And you can see how this is a hard one because this was the, the image that was not handwritten very well. 
and they've done really well here, right? So again, I'm not going to penalize Amazon. There's a ton of errors here, but at that time, May 2020, they didn't have uh, the handwriting recognition was not supported. So interestingly, Google and Microsoft pretty ahead of the game already there by actually having that supported. And I mean, it's not easy, like no PDFs or otherwise. And AI thinks it's wraps on Azure. Interesting. That email is extremely hard. Guest editor BHP at Gmail. Human can read it, but it's hard for them. And then you look at the line. It's done a very good job putting it in the same line, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And look at, I mean, Google has a lot more errors here. And interestingly, Google misses on one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> it, it, it loses all the, the, the letters. Numbers. Yeah, the numbers. I mean, it's like interesting. Like the numbers are just gone. Like AI goes, well, here's a number. Forget it. <laughs> so there's a lot to learn here on how that AI is being trained, right? And then this one. I mean, amazing. So Microsoft's a great winner here. This was actually very mm -hmm. surprising to us in 2020. Microsoft only had two errors if it is a beautiful, beautiful handwriting. So that's cursive. So they probably have a really good training done on this. And this I was is very surprised. Cognitive services, right? Absolutely. Azure Cognitive Services, one line, one call, literally takes you less than five minutes to have this solution in your, uh, you know, uh, enterprise software. And then Google, we were surprised to see, you know, our, our entire interns pointed out that Jalicitations is not even a word in English dictionary. And Google actually has what I would call a spell check, right? They were the first ones to actually come up with it. And interestingly, somehow Microsoft AI does a very good job at that. And Google, even though it has it, doesn't solve that problem when it comes to computer vision because I think they're doing pure computer vision here. And maybe okay. Microsoft might be using some, I don't know, I mean, just a guess, right? Something behind the scenes that makes it so much better. But if I were to make the solution happen on Google Cloud, for example, what I would do is use both different services and uh, you know pipeline the models. So have the first model, then maybe have the second model of spell check if I know the language, if it's English, let's say, or French, then have a French, you know, uh, spell check. And maybe then I'll model my own model that is specific to my client. And this is how we build solutions for our clients where they don't have to pay, you know, six months, one year worth of work to developers to go code all this that is already available. We can bring these solutions and augment the rest. And in this case with Microsoft, right? I mean, this is really quick and really easy and there's barely any errors. And you could see, like, that's such a u easy utility uh, to use. And then, of course, you know, uh, let's not talk about Amazon there because of the reason I mentioned earlier. But here was another interesting uh, thing we noticed that Google was the only one that went, wait a minute, these are two images. Mm -hmm. Microsoft and Amazon actually thought, at least at that time, that this is just one image and they just went left to right. So that was right. interesting. Now that depends on your data, right? Now if your data is just one page, one image at a time, you got nothing to worry. But if you got image, you know, data like that, well, what you can do in this situation is do multi-cloud. You can now use Google for that particular pipeline, right? So it's so so that particular aspect of the pipeline can be a Google call, and then you can run it through a Microsoft one to make sure you have even a better solution at some point in time. And then here is where I thought Google excelled, which was uh, French. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, there's just four errors here. And I think Microsoft still got less than 10, which is still not bad. And Google's only got one error there. So French, for some reason, Google's uh, definitely number one. And here's the final results. As you can see, Microsoft um, overall wins. Microsoft's got only 12 errors. Google's got 20. Amazon's 137, but they were not supporting it. So let's ignore them for a second. But the second one, Google's got... 15 times more errors. And then this is where I was like, wow. So good cursive handwriting. Microsoft's almost as good as a human. And then finally, the French one, Microsoft's got almost four, five times more errors than Google. So great results. You know, no clear winner. Again, if we were to do it for our clients, we, would, we could use a multi-cloud strategy with Microsoft and Google in this case and augment that with their own domain expertise and add more yeah. stuff. Anyways, any questions, comments, you know, observations here? Well, David? you could, um, uh, for example, the the 19 errors that Microsoft had, I'm assuming some of those are because it didn't recognize it was two pages. And you could do some pre-processing and just tell it ahead of time. Absolutely. Maybe split that into two images and improve, I think, I think drastically improve your results. 100%. And, you know, that's one of the other things is that we also tricked them. We didn't tell them what language it is. 
We just wanted to see what they do <clears> on their own. And that's another thing with Microsoft having language support now, which you've right. seen a bunch of it. It's, it's pretty incredible, the, the amount of changes we've seen over the last two years. You could easily do that to get rid of a lot of those errors. So that's one other, yeah. you know, minute detail. But again, right, we're, we're, we're sharing these details, but there's so much detail that you have to know to use the cloud in the right way. You know, we talked to so many architects all over the world that are actually specializing in some of the clouds, and you'd be surprised how much they are behind where the cloud already is. Most of the times, they don't even know the capability the cloud has. And, you know, we have that advantage of working with so many companies, Fortune 500, you know, mid-sized startups that we get to see so much more. And we also get to see what's working, what's not working. You know, we had a client. They spent like six months on one POC, another nine months on another one. And literally, when they were talking to us in the first four hours, we showed them results. And then they go, why in the world do we spend millions doing POCs? We should have just asked you guys because we've already <laughs> done a lot of that. And, and we were like, this was not even going to work. You know, so that yeah. is luckily we're in a very good spot here to to be in that spot to even know how much good stuff is coming and how it's getting better. And um, here's an interesting slide, by the way. Um, you would think that two and a half years later, so this is October 2022, Google would do better. And it does in some cases. For example, look at that. Sincerest and felicitations. Those are definitely words that it gets right. And, you know, jealousitations. I, mean, I don't necessarily think it's spell check. I think it's still computer vision, but they did it really well. Uh, however, check this out. My dear James, that's a structural error. And now my dear James is right here instead uh -huh. of where it was there. So one of the other things we do is we don't ever take an answer and go, well, everything is the same exact weight. We change the weight based on how the AI produces results. And we do this because, you know, we got clients and they just can't, they just can't afford to have something like that come in here because that's a structural error that's going to mess up more things for them. It's okay to lose a word or two or get it wrong, but the moment you have a structural error, that's actually a bigger problem. So when we do internal weighting, we give five, a weight of five to structure and a weight of two to accuracy in terms of word accuracy, right? So this is interesting because you would have thought two and a half years later, it would be a better solution. If you take the full math weighted average, Google actually got worse. And if you take just the accuracy, Google, Google got better. I think better. that's another thing you got to keep paying attention to is where's your cloud going? Because what if you built a solution based on this without realizing that now there's a structural error? Are you going to stick to the previous version? I mean, those are the kind of things that you have to know because you're, you know, you know, you're in production and your customers are waiting for, you know, something like your solution. So um, then, by the way, form recognizer, and this is a really cool one. Anyways, any, any, any questions so far? This is interesting stuff. Can you talk about some real world examples? Absolutely. You know, we've got clients that have, one of them actually has more than 100 years worth of invoices that are handwritten in the past, right? So even though they have everything digital today, it's a lot of data that uh, comes in as invoices, you know, and receipts. You and I have done this. A lot of times we are traveling for work, you know, we speak at so many conferences and now you got to take the receipts, give it to your employer. I mean, that's a very good use case. And really where we are today is very different than where we were 10 years ago. You know, let me give you a couple of examples of how Again, these are hypothetical examples. I'm just taking names uh, to make it more relevant to people out there, but we have very similar use cases we do with our clients. So let's say you are McDonald's or Wendy's and you want to compete with each other. You come up with a Thanksgiving ad and Wendy's comes with an ad that's way better than McDonald's, right? But what is McDonald's going to do in the past 10 years ago in order to just get a new, you know, delivery on their website? Some companies would, you know, push things three months, once in three months. Some of them would do once in 10 years. With a microservices model, with a cloud model, you could do it real time. And even real time doesn't necessarily mean you could do it really quickly because you still need a developer to go code it for you and it takes time and you may lose that opportunity. So now the way things can be done very differently and very, very automated fashion in an automated fashion is by taking, let's say, real time actions, not just real time analysis, right? What does that mean? So if I'm McDonald's, Wendy's has an ad, 20% off, whatever, my bot literally could be checking their website and looking for that image. 
And with that image, I can use computer vision, something like form recognizer or whatever, and, and also, uh, you know, get the data out and go, well, all right, they've got 20%, fine, I'll do 25%. And I've got an automated system that automatically takes off 5% of whatever Wendy's does, for example. And now I can push that literally to my, uh, you know, configuration, whatever I have. It's a database configuration, whatever I have, and my new ad is already popped, ready to go. Now, a lot of people are like, well, what if this gets misused? You know, it can. So what you can always do is do the entire thing at real-time action and literally have one click ready for a human to approve it if you need approval. Because let's say you're a public company, you know, you got to have to have approval for whatever reason, perfectly fine. But now you don't have to do anything else. Everything else is automated. It's a real-time action. So we're staying with one click. You have a click. It's on your website. Done, right? Take another example. There's so many companies nowadays giving incentives to, you know, purchase a hotel, uh, let's say, last, you know, a day before uh, it's getting booked. So it's the last day. Hotel can't fill it. It's got 300 rooms left. They're willing to give you a discount. Well, then there's a lot of other companies like restaurants are willing to give you a discount, especially Friday night, right? If they've got like 20 tables empty, they'd rather give you a discount because they're paying their servers. So let's just make this up, right? So if, if I've got that data that every Friday night you either go to IHOP or one of their competitors, and I'm a competitor, I want to push you that ad literally Friday night before you're going to go to a restaurant where I'm saying here's 20% off tonight. And right. chances are, if it is similar kind of food and it's a competitive restaurant that you've been there, you are probably not going to not go IHOP and you're going to over, go over there, right? All of this could be done with AI. And then these are real-time actions, not just analysis. A lot of people focus on real-time analysis. And keep in mind, just a few years ago, people would run data uh, you know, engines for hours and sometimes days to get these kind of analysis. We're talking real-time actions. Right. Now take a uh, you know, form recognizer could be used in so many different ways. Here's an example of form. We all know. We all pay taxes, right? So W-2 form. I mean, how hard previously it was, you got to handwrite all of this, push it in a database if you got to do it. Now, with form recognizer, uh, you know, you could just come in and say, all right, these are the fields. Here's a social security number. And here's your you know, address and not just address. You could specify that particular part is zip code, that particular part is the city, right? Here's address line number one and whatever. And you can right. digitalize all this, push it to the database of your choice, like Azure, Cosmos, DB or whatever, and literally real-time analysis on something like that. If, if that's what you care, right? And you can do it on Amazon, text track, right? And you can do it Google Document AI, Microsoft Form Recognizer, they all do it. It's pretty easy. You can actually go to their websites and try some of this on your own. We used APIs and interestingly, we ran uh, uh, every single thing, including uh, the model. And in this case, as you can see, Amazon took like one hour uh, at that, uh, in May, 2020. And you can see the results here. They're telling you the true positive, and the confidence they have. Everything is a probability in AI, so they are saying 85% they're true positive. Others could be false positive, right? And similar story across the board. We did five samples, and you missed some data. I mean, in 10 samples, you missed some other data. And this is Amazon. You've got Google. Google, I think the minimum was 10 forms at that time. You couldn't do five samples. That was interesting. Google took about 74 minutes. And uh, you know, similar custom labeling, as you can see. And of course, some places that miss data. I mean, then of course, Microsoft does this. And by the way, that's a really cool tool, FOTT, and they've done a very good job improving it. Um, that team's done a phenomenal job and it gives you a lot of good benefits. I definitely highly recommend checking it out, but here's the good news, five seconds. May 2020, we're looking at this going, oh my gosh, Microsoft's running stuff in five seconds. That's which, an order by the way, magnitude faster. Yeah, and look at this, right, five samples, Google cannot do it at that time at least, and 52 minutes versus three seconds. Three regions unidentified. Microsoft only one and a half regions unidentified with three seconds, and here's the best part. They were the only ones at that time with bounded box with OCR. So you need a bounded box because you need to know the coordinates of where you got the data from, otherwise it's just data. And now you gotta write code to make sure you're putting the right place, and that gets really complicated. Now watch this. Five seconds for 10 samples. I mean, one hour, 14 minutes versus one hour, three minutes. So where's real time action? I mean, it's almost impossible in that situation. However, I really like one thing about Google here. Accuracy was 100%. With 10 samples, if you give it 10 samples, they had 100% accuracy, right? So here's where you know we have to now 
work with clients and say, hey, what do you really care about at this point of time? Do you going to go with probability? Like, does it even matter? Like, you know, Wendy's was down, Wendy's is down 18% or 20, as long as you're going to cut the deal by one or 2%. What, what, what matters to you? Are you willing to wait one hour? If you are, well, you have a different solution. And, you know, if accuracy is more important to you and you have a different offline process, perfectly, you can choose a different sample or, or cloud. And in this case, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different things you can do here, but pretty much time and accuracy, it's not going very well together, except in case of Microsoft where only one and a half unidentified regions, not bad. But at that time, you had bounded box only at Microsoft. So this was the only preferred solution we could have. Yeah, and of a lot course, of it depends now on that, the, the the problem statement. If you're if you're sending out coupons and you send a few to people that aren't interested or you miss a few, that's not a big deal. But if you're doing tax returns and you get information, absolutely. <laughs> that's huge. It's it's probably worth an extra hour to get them 100. percent Right, and you know, in those situations, by the way, I think you would still have a manual component because even if right. the accuracy is 100, percent in some cases. What if you're wrong in one or two or three? Which yeah. with AI, that's always the which case. Which adds so a lot. We, which adds more time, of course, because it's right. that important. So we definitely have UI that we build for uh, you know users to look at it. But here's what right. happened: instead of having 200 people doing this, you can have three people doing this. And I think that's the time savings and productivity savings which matter, right? Invoice recognition. I think Amazon did amazing. Um, I don't know why not a single AI could get quantity right. That was interesting. <laughs> Everyone got OTY. <laughs> interesting. And for some reason, they would miss numbers. Like, they just miss one here for some reason, right? And hmm. Microsoft misses one and four and quantity. But look at this. Like, it's not such a big difference. But here, it almost looks like Amazon's the best and Google's twice as worse and Microsoft's four times as worse, even though it's kind of a similar kind of error. Yeah, right? they're, all, they're all pretty good in this case. Right. Uh, I mean, it's very, very well done. And then look at this, right? We we even told the intern, use really one of your own, <laughs> you know, uh, what a, a receipt and make sure it's not very well done. So it's kind of a mutilated receipt. We sure, wanted to see how that works, right? It's like a real world analysis. I mean, like you got to put it in your pocket. It can go bad. But look, here's interesting. Anytime you see this box, we, that's our way of saying there's a structural error. So you see yeah. what happened here? WT and WT. It just got a little messed up. Right. So now you're in a completely different line, and you, you have two WTs. That's, that was interesting. Well, one other thing we noticed was no one understood pound, as in LB. It was 1B everywhere, which is funny. Mm. <laughs> so that was one thing we noticed. And, and Google has somehow, for some reason, at least then, a ton of structural errors. You see, like this particular box is supposedly here, and it somehow uh. thinks it's over there. So, so there's some work needed to be done. Another yeah. one is supposedly here. Uh, while it was here, and it thinks it's here while it was here. So that was a That's big a one. real problem on our receipt because lining them up is the whole point. Right. <laughs> knowing, knowing which price goes with which line is, is really the point of it all. This one is tricky. I mean, S and 5, I can see why Microsoft gets yeah. one S correct, but I don't know why the other three. And then look at that, 1B instead of LB. I think this is an easy, this is probably the easiest error to fix. This is just one more logic to your method that. If, if you see this, fix it, right? But here, only one structural error. But I love this error because this was the closest structural error. Like, you're really, really close. It's not that bad. It's like you're just one light flying off. But that's also because it is not a straight receipt, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that humans can see this. We're kind of 3D. We understand what it is. It's kind of 2D always for the AI. Everything is a 2D. So that's where the difference is. So results, I mean, you know, of course, Microsoft wins here again, and a lot of it is because of also not just a structural error, but also the error count is pretty low. Uh, still, I think Google does very well in error count too, right? Um, now, okay. the way we're counting errors here, just so you know, if you had that 1B, we're just saying it one time because that's one error technically. So even though you see it 10 times in that receipt, that just doesn't matter, right? And yeah. Amazon, despite having more errors, actually is a better AI than Google in this scenario, just because the structural error, Google's got three, Amazon's got one, you know? Awesome. So overall, Microsoft wins, uh, Amazon's pretty close, and then uh, okay. Google's got structural errors, yeah. 
Okay, you so, probably have a lot of case studies like this where you've compared them on different tons. <laughs> scenarios, different things. Um, but I think you've already made the point with the, the three or so that you've shown is that sometimes one cloud wins, sometimes another cloud wins. It just depends on what it is. Are you, are, when you address this with your customers, are you often advocating for a multi-cloud scenario uh, to cover what's where one cloud is strong here but weak there? Or are you just saying, let's just pick a cloud and the one that appears to do best in this scenario and use that one? What's, what's your general strategy? I mean, definitely, that's something that comes up all the time. So, for example, if you are an enterprise customer and you are on one cloud, it's a big challenge for them to now have a multi-cloud strategy, especially if it requires moving their data over. But when it is something like an API call, it's not a big deal. So when enterprise customers look at multi-cloud strategy, they're thinking 70% more or 80% more cost or more, right? Depends on uh, what they're really trying to do. But for something as simple as an AI, where which is literally an API call, it's kind of a no-brainer that you're, you're better off using at least two clouds out of three, if not all the three, right? And it's not hard to advocate that because they can see the benefit in, in different situations. And then it's always, there's an augmentation of some kind of domain specific, um, you know, I would say like rule based solution that's deterministic or AI oriented that you may have to use. And that's always the case, right? So no matter what company you are, you're in healthcare, or whatever, you have some kind of terminology, there are certain things you can always look for. And if you're doing receipt recognition, you're, you're definitely going to have pounds, right? Or kilograms if you're in the metric system or whatever. And we work with customers all over the place. So you'll always have some kind of logic that's going to handle. And that could be partly AI, and that could also be partly deterministic. So it's usually multi-cloud with a couple of others. But then there's a lot of times we also have customers that are, they have full reservation going out of their cloud or even going out of on-premises, right? So that's when we have to come in and explain to them that this is not necessarily a moving to a cloud you're literally making calls here, right? And then you have to look at, okay, what kind of data policies they have and all that kind of stuff. So if they're on a cloud, then it's easy to use another cloud. But if they're not on a cloud for whatever reason, well, then it's sometimes it's even like, well, we can't even use it's such a good offering out there. We're going to have to train our own data. And that's understandable because the way their compliance is or where they are in this trajectory to either move to cloud or, you know, whatever. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of factors involved there. Sure. So you've got a lot of hybrid uh, scenarios here. It's non-cloud versus cloud. It's which cloud. It's whether you're using AI versus deterministic programming. Uh, and sometimes you're going to combine all those things together. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're just about at time here. Um, is there anything that we really should hit on that we haven't covered yet? Well, I could say the last page, I, you know, there's a bunch of reports that are completely free. Now, if I know people have a reservation with giving away emails. So what we did is we actually, we don't require you to provide any emails to us. You can actually go and read these uh, reports online. They have a lot more okay. comprehensive details. And, you know, if you want the PDF version of it, that's the only time we require an email. That's it. Wow. Excellent. Chandra, thank you so much for your time. This has been really interesting. Well, thank you for having me. Well, here's the best thing about technology. I have made friends, really amazing friends, friends like you, as you know, for decades now, thanks to only one thing, technology.